It's morning in America. Ronald Reagan's famous phrase was pitched to give Americans back their agency, to sell the sense that tomorrow can be remade exactly as we want it. That however bedraggled and damaged the country might be, like the smell of dew on grass, the promise of renewal never truly goes away. Of course, here in Budapest, whenever it's morning in America, it's always mid-afternoon. Visitors usually remark on how Budapest feels like Europe used to be. Hungary is a country where the streets are safe and people are friendly. It has escaped many of the pathologies of the modern world. Meanwhile, in the same period, Americans have lived through Ferguson and George Floyd. Me too, and the 1619 Project. Transgender admirals and transracialism. The country has lost its self-confidence in ways that no Iranian hostage crisis could have forced. But it's always darkest before dawn. Take a moment, look around. Can you feel the vibe shift? For the first time since 2008, the 21st century has decisively changed gears. After all, America is where the world's biggest disasters are incubated, but it's also where its boldest cures are born. Now for Americans, nothing short of a revolution is afoot. Where Donald Trump's first term was stymied by endless press wars, internal incompetence, and inside saboteurs, this time, there seems to be a game plan. In some ways, the Hungarian experience has been important in shoring up a conservative model of governance, a theory of how a modern conservative state can get things done rather than just win elections. And by the grace of Elon, this time, it might just work. Now, in geopolitics, in culture, and in the grand bargain between the social classes, America is about to be made anew. For better and for worse, where America goes, we and Europe must surely follow. Trump, the world, and the vibe shift. This time, on The View from the Danube. Hello, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rod Dreher. With me, as ever, are John O'Sullivan, president of the Danube Institute, and Callum Nicholson, our director of research. This week, we are joined by a friend of the Danube Institute, David P. Goldman. David is deputy editor of the Asia Times, where he is widely known and loved for his Spengler columns. He's also a Washington fellow of the Claremont Institute and an author, most recently, of you will be assimilated, China's plan to Sinoform the world. Gentlemen, good evening, and thanks for coming today. Since we last gathered, at least the two of us, there has been events on the other side of the ocean. Donald Trump and J.D. Vance were elected president, and uh, the world has changed, has it not? What do you think is, are the top lines to be derived from, from this event? Well, something that didn't happen. There were no big riots when it was plain that Trump had won the election. They told us there would be. Absolutely. The, America would rebel against this monstrous election. But in fact, they didn't. And in addition to there not actually being any strong opposition in the form of riots, there, were, there was, in fact, an extraordinary and curious sense of relief. There was, among the po part of the population, which is 50%, um, a sense that, my goodness, an era is passing, one in which we never quite know what the correct thing to say is. We must watch our words. We can't offend anybody. Um, Americans were never used 
to being afraid of offending people. I mean, if you think of it, the America's demotic language, the way ordinary Americans spoke back in the 20s, the 30s, the 50s, and so on, it was very direct, very simple. Among New Yorkers, it was profane very frequently. But well, there wasn't this walking on eggshells feelings that, that people had come to feel or have been compelled to feel, really. And... Um, I think that was, in a way, the most significant thing about the election, because it told you that under the, under the carapace of American political dialogue and discussion on the talk shows and so on, there was a nation struggling to rebel and say what it really felt. And suddenly, they were in bars celebrating, enjoying themselves, and toasting each other. Will that last? No, it won't. But it's an interesting beginning. It is interesting you say that. I just got back from an ideas conference in Amsterdam over the weekend, and there were a few Hollywood people there, both on the program and in the audience. And it drinks afterward. Some of them were saying, yeah, we're liberal. We're not for Trump. But maybe, just maybe, the woke fever will be broken now because even though they're liberals, they're sick of what wokeness is doing to the creation of art. What about you, David? What do you think are the, is the big news from the election? Well... I think that the regime of globalism, which treated people as commodities to, out of which the maximum of value was to be extracted, uh, reached the end of its rope. There was a rebellion against it. The uh, idea of corporate efficiency, which transferred an enormous amount of gross domestic product out of household income into corporate profits, uh, an unprecedented shift left American households, particularly the bottom half of households, feeling impoverished, uh, insecure, and without a future, particularly young people. So Trump's appeal uh, that America could be the land of opportunity again for all its citizens had an enormous resonance because people were hurting. Uh, Just as an example, uh, former Democratic Treasury Secretary and Harvard University President Larry Summers had calculated that if you take into effect the cost of high interest rates on consumer balance sheets, the rate of inflation last year peaked at 18%. That's the worst since the Civil War, much worse than the great inflation of the 1970s. And if you ask any housewife what her grocery basket looked like, she'd say at least 10% increase per year, much higher than the official numbers. So the sense that the... Uh, corporate giants, Silicon Valley, the billionaires were wringing the last drop of blood out of American households, really enraged people, and Trump offered an alternative. And I think the cultural issue is also important because people had a sense that an ideological elite was willing to play Dr. Frankenstein with American families. It's one, Americans are very tolerant people. They don't mind men who decide they have to live as women. They don't mind homosexual relationships. There's overwhelming support for gay marriage. But when it comes to having male athletes compete against women because they declare themselves to be women, or even worse, having school officials give, uh, puberty blockers to nine-year-olds without informing the parents or having courts take children, minor children away from parents because they refuse to play the gender affirmation game, uh, people are outraged. So liberalism overreached in several respects. It overreached in terms of what it took out of American, the height of American households economically, and it overreached in pushing a cultural agenda which broke the patience of a very tolerant and forgiving people. And all of that produced uh, a really unexpected landslide. Uh, One thing we learned is that Hispanics, particularly Hispanic men, are more interested in their economic prospects and the integrity of their culture than they are at being pandered to by liberals who want to no, give them handouts through diversity uh, programs. Uh, black men as well. Black men as well. And but, women who did not vote for Kamala at, in the numbers predicted. Absolutely. Uh, it didn't help the Democrats that the candidates they fielded were without any doubt the weakest, even the silliest <laughs> in American history. Democrats really painted themselves into a corner, of course, by 
sticking with the myth that uh, Joe Biden was of sound mind, which he clearly was. And after covering this up with every mechanism they had available to them for a year, they had to admit that it had been a lie. <coughs> and they had very little time to come up with an alternative candidate. They probably would have done better to have started primaries at the last minute, but they made the uh, stupid decision to advance Kamala Harris, who turned out to be the least attractive presidential candidate uh, uh, probably in American history, um, maybe since Henry Wallace ran in the uh, Progressive Party platform in 1948. Well, Callum, how about you? What did you see happening in America last week? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, the I think if you pull back a bit, we, we've talked a lot these days about the woke stuff the last seven or eight, nine years. But really, the woke stuff is just a more intense manifestation with a label of the broader trend of political correctness. It's been around really since the end of the Cold War. I remember as a kid uh, in the early 90s, my brothers are a decade older than me. And in school, they weren't subject to any of this in the 80s. And I was in the 90s. And it's just got more and more canonized since then. It's become more systematized. And um, I think people are, if you think about what all that stuff is, it's really people beginning, not from how the world is, but from how they believe it ought to be. And I think what Trump's victory represents here is it's a sort of bonfire of all the vanities of a culture that believes it can reform itself as an ideal, as a sense of how it ought to be. And I think, honestly, if we're always trying to aspire to a perfect version of ourselves. It could have been in terms of wealth, or it could have been in terms of health, you know, go to the gym, or it could have been in terms of yourself, in terms of your mor morality. Um, I think it I gets to a point where we all realize we'll never get there. And if you look at the woke movements, they always eat their own. They don't actually cancel conservatives. They cancel people who are apostates, who leave their group. And uh, I think people eventually get, have got sick of the the, the, the heaviness of this culture. And so I get the sense that in Trump's uh, victory, the general feeling and the sense of a vibe, you know, you said in, in, the, in the beginning of this look around you, you know, feel the vibe. Um, there was a great sense of, I think, relief. And there was an interesting event last week or a couple of days ago, maybe, uh, um, when we we're filming this, the, uh, uh, there's a UFC event in Madison Square Garden. Which UFC? The, uh, the, uh, uh, it's the ultimate fighting championship. And Trump went and Vance went and, uh, and his whole cabinet went. Oh, Joe and Joe Rogan was there. Joe too, Rogan yeah. was obviously there, yeah. And the whole group of them. And it's really interesting, you look at the audience, there was a general sense of, um, of, uh, of relief and a sense of just being, ha being happily who they are. It, there wasn't anger, there wasn't ideology, there wasn't politics. It was just uh, people feeling unselfconscious, unjudged. They came out, you might say. Yeah, yeah they did. And they, this, well, this is it. It's a, in a sense that the people, in a sense, who've had to be in the closet for 20 years are people, are people as they really are. And, and not in a, um, just simply all of us and just being simply the reality of what it is. Now, before we, we start talking about what Trump is likely to do, I want to spend a moment talking about how the left are, are reacting to it or how they might react uh, at this conference in Amsterdam, there were mostly liberals there, and there were a few who seemed to be living in the real world with the rest of us, but it was striking to me how most of them were utterly shell-shocked by what was happening and could not seem to accept it as something that they should learn from. Uh, it was something along the lines of what Seth Moulton, the Democratic uh, uh, congressman from Massachusetts, said. Uh, he, he came out and said in, after the election, gave an interview and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm a liberal, I'm a Democrat, but I have daughters. I don't want my daughters playing, at, uh, playing sports and being knocked down by biological males. He said that, and the next day, his chief of staff, I believe it was, resigned over this transphobia, which just proves the point that you, there's some things you can't say on the left. Um, the thing that I noticed at, at the Ideas Conference, talking to some of these people, these are, you know, one of whom was a... Um, uh, is a defense official in the Biden administration, assistant secretary of defense. They just can't cope with it. And uh, I, I was struck that they seem to be determined to live in the past. Now, I don't expect them to approve of, of Trump. Certainly not. They don't agree with him philosophically. The thing that struck me, though, was it was almost about epistemology. You know, they couldn't accept the facts that were right in front of them. Uh, and I, I was reminded on, in reflection on something Edith Stein, the the Jewish-born Carmelite uh, philosopher who died in Auschwitz, something she wrote, saying that for a certain kind of secular liberal, uh, they, they can't see reality because they identify so fully with their idea of the good that 
to admit facts that con- contradict their ideas is a nullification of the good, and that's too much for a lot of people to take. Does that make sense to you when you look around and see what, how the left are reacting to this? Well, indeed, and I think that's what makes the uh, next two months particularly dangerous, because given the self-righteousness and sense of absolute entitlement to the truth of the left, uh, the left will do anything possible to sabotage Trump before he comes in. Uh, uh, the Hungarian uh, officials of the Hungarian government, for example, have pointed to Biden's decision to give uh, Ukraine permission to use long-range U.S. missiles to attack deep inside Russia as an extremely dangerous move. Why do that now, after uh, more than two years of war? I think the only possible explanation is that they want to make it much more difficult for Trump to uh, find a peace settlement for Ukraine, which was a major and very popular part of his uh, electoral platform, uh, by provoking escalation to the extent they can. Uh, and there are many other ways this could happen. So anything that the liberals, that the rem- remnants of the Biden administration will be able to do to trip up Trump and make things difficult, to muddy the waters, to uh, provoke difficulties, they will do because they think that as the sole possessors of the truth, there's no deed so foul or so condemnable that it isn't justified by their, um, you know, uh, their uh, sole command of the truth. Extremism in defense of liberalism is no vice. In other yes, words. exactly. John? If you remember, <clears throat> when that remark was made, and it ended, and moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue, um, a, a great political th- uh, theorist, uh, Wilmore C. Kendall, said there's nothing wrong with that statement that couldn't be put right by a hundred thousand well-chosen words. (laughs) (laughs) And and that applies here. But I think if I could just take all the points that David made and say, let's run that backwards in reverse. For example, um, in in the weeks and the months leading to the election, they had thrown everything at him, including long prison terms, lawfare of an extravagant kind, the the statements by defense and intelligence officials that he was a danger to the country, you name it, um, they said that about him. And they must have thought, against those odds, no, nobody can prevail. And and I think a lot of people on the right felt that as well. They were in despair towards the end because they thought, how can we possibly win against such a united establishment barrage? Well, he did win. And that, of course, produced the relief I was talking about before, but it also produced this astounding kind of depression and um, inability to grasp what had happened on the part of the left. So that you have seen since since the election, uh, on the left, you've, you've seen these series of breakdowns. People, there are now quite, if you turn on the internet, you can watch any number of young women having nervous breakdowns and, <laughs> and, and trying to solve them by primal screams. And, and shaving their heads, have you seen Shave, that? Shaving their heads and dressing up in fancy dress clothes as, as, act, as, as you know, extras in The Handmaid's Tale. This kind of thing now, is the four-year hysterical sex strike. Yeah, yes, like, and if you've right. seen the sex strike, when you're like, honey, don't flatter yourself. <laughs> you know? yeah, yes, but the, the point is the sex strike is going to be against men who voted for Trump. But it's the poor liberal guys who didn't vote for Trump uh, who are going to be the victims of it. Because after all, none of these girls are going after jocks. They're not going after the guys who were, um, you know, smart blue blazers and, and uh, corduroy <laughs> trousers and so on in, in, right. in uh, Country House Weekend. The, the boyfriends of the wives of the liberals are not at all worried about the sex <laughs> right. Tell them. Well, I do think what's happened though in the last uh, few months even is that um, is, is it, I think the, the way people have tried to handle Trump from the left has exposed the reality of the left. It's been hugely, I mean, we think of the word apocalypse as being in cataclysm, right? But the, the original meaning of the word apocalypse is revelation. And there's been a, a bit of an electoral apocalypse for the, for the Democratic Party. But it's been quite revealing, I think, of the true nature of the problems they have. And they're clearly 
at the moment, uh, they don't seem very electable. And I think one of the problems they had last time was they kept looking at Trump and saying, well, he's pathological. You know, he's a pathological, whatever you want to describe. And Trump's certainly an odd guy, I think. But that's part of his, his, I think, his, uh, his, his success to some extent. But, the, but what they were never doing is saying, what is the pathology in society where an, out, an outsider, like where the establishment has failed them to such an extent they turn to someone like Trump? They spent four years saying Trump's pathological. But actually, you could, if you don't like Trump, if you are a Democrat... The, the worst you can say is a symptom of a disease. So what is the disease you need to, need to tackle? And they did not do any proper diagnosis of the problem. And increasingly, I think part of the problem is their own uh, myopia. This, what we've seen in the US and also in the UK is what I call the, the gentrification of the left. You've had um, sort of middle class, sort of suburban, um, abstract uh, ideological preoccupations overtake sort of bread and butter issues that used to be uh, the basis of uh, certainly the left in the UK and um, and I think in the States too. So it's the, I think the, the Democrats really have to, in a sense what we're seeing to some extent now with all these uh, ranting and raving is a sort of narcissistic collapse of the left, the sense that the the entire narcissism of thinking they had the answers, that they could save everyone, and, uh, that's been falsified and by Cal, experience. Cal, the irony here is that the left was catastrophically incompetent in several different ways. Uh, the inflation is the result of Biden's failed attempt to buy off constituencies by throwing vast amounts of money, particularly into transfer payments. Mm -hmm. uh, Biden was running a deficit of uh, nearly 7% of GDP during a peacetime expansion. To my knowledge, that's never happened before. There was an enormous increase in spending, particularly federal transfer payments. The second round of COVID stimulus checks, which was completely unnecessary given that the economy had already begun to, begun to recover, is what drove the inflation. It's like going to a ballpark and giving out uh, 10,000 hot dog vouchers when there are only 5,000 hot dogs out there. So the people who were cheated by this, who are most hurt, are the lower income families who spend most of their money, whose food and rent and electricity and other basic bills went through the ceiling and effectively had a 15, 20 percent pay cut during the course of this. This was an unintended consequence by incompetent social manipulators. And the second thing that really sandbagged Biden was the Federal Reserve's attempt to fix this with higher interest rates, which was like pouring gasoline on the fire. That was Larry Summers' point, that if you take into account the higher cost of credit, the real inflation rate peaked at 18 percent. Just as an example, Americans are living off their credit cards, a record increase in credit card balances because they're not making enough money to maintain their living standards. The interest rate on credit cards went from an average of 15% to 22%. That cost American consumers $150 billion a year. People who were paying no taxes got bumped into higher tax brackets by inflation, and that cost them another several hundred billion dollars a year. So all these things together, by incompetence on the part of Biden and his team, uh, hurt people whom they were trying to buy off. And there's a parallel to Ukraine. The Ukraine war was not a critical issue. But certainly, the fact that the Biden administration, Biden personally announced that this war would overthrow Putin, cut the Russian economy in half, uh, all this nonsense, this was the biggest disaster that the United States has ever faced as a major power, in a sense worse than Vietnam. We thought... And the whole foreign policy establishment thought Putin would be overthrown, Russian economy would be crushed, and Russia won the war, effectively. So the United States was humiliated. Uh, we didn't have body bags coming back, but we did have nearly $200 billion bill. So the liberal stupidity and competence, this self-righteous, Ivy League-educated, uber-elite, turned out to be the worst stumble bums and bunglers in the history of the United States. The best and the Americans brightest. can smell it. Well, I'm the person who disagrees with you, I think, around the table here, as we know uh, from our earlier conversation. I don't, by no means uh, in, in, entirely, by the way, obviously, a lot of what you said seems to me to be correct and common sense. But first, my first question, would be, my first point would be to say, what you're saying 
is very interesting, but it's a prediction. I mean, you say Russia has won and we have lost. They certainly seem to be making ground now. Um, they previously lost a lot of ground with the, the, the first year and a half, really. Uh, and so we, we, we don't know exactly how it will end. The second point I would say is this. What would, what would you have proposed we do on the immediate morrow of the Russian invasion. The reason I ask that, of course, is had we done nothing, that would have, in a sense, shown not that the NATO pledge was valueless, no, but that it was slight, it was somewhat undermined because although, obviously, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, that's one of the Kazos Belli, that's the Kazos Belli, rather, and nonetheless, if if you if if well, there had been no Western response to a Russian invasion of a European uh, country, um, there would have been a sense that there was that the West was weak uh, in the face of aggression. And secondly, of course, that would compound the damage already done by the scuttle from Afghanistan, which, in my view, was an error. Not because uh, eventually, eventually we would have had to withdraw, but the way we withdrew. And the fact that we withdrew when there was no serious threat to American forces that at that point was a mistake. At the point that Putin went in, uh, the die was cast and a disaster was inevitable. Before that, uh, we had the opportunity with uh, the so-called Minsk II agreement to get a deal which the Russians, in fact, had proposed, which was... Uh, a sovereign Ukraine with Russophone um, privileges, autonomy but not sovereignty, uh, neutral uh, Ukraine, uh, and the, the Russians, since they proposed it, would have lived with that. They would not have risked the invasion. Uh, Zelensky, of course, said we want to join NATO, Ukrainians want to join NATO, so we're rejecting neutrality. Uh, I do not believe that Zelensky would have advanced that and insisted on it without strong backing from the United States. If the United States said, no, this is what you're going to have to accept, uh, we would have avoided the whole mess. The Russians would not have taken territory. They would have kept Crimea. That's already from 2014. But Crimea is entirely Russian anyway. It's basically taken over from the Tatars by uh, Catherine the Great in the 1790s. So uh, not a big loss. I think the, the catastrophe could have easily been avoided in late 2021. That's certainly the view of Hungary's foreign ministry. It's the view of everyone I know in Germany. Uh, and, of course, you can't prove a hypothetical after the fact, but I have a very strong, I think there are strong grounds to believe that. So, so why wasn't it done? I, because I think that the uh, Biden administration wanted regime change in Russia. They thought they were going to get it. Biden announced there would be regime changes, that Putin can't remain in power. He announced in a tweet in March 2022, the Russian economy will be cut in half. They believed that. And it wasn't just the Democrats. The renegade Trump veterans from, you know, the national security establishment, the people whom he kicked out and wrote nasty things about him afterwards, were all saying, and I heard them say this at conferences, in early 2022, that Putin was going to crash and we shouldn't give him an off-ramp. We should make sure he's overthrown. So it was a belief on the part of both sides, the Romney wing of the Republican Party and the Democrats, that the long-desired goal of regime change in Russia, the deposition of Vladimir Putin was around the corner and this would do it. We made a catastrophic blunder and Putin not only survived, uh, he prevailed, and he prevailed by having a better industrial machine than the United States. That's what's so humiliating. We who were the forge of freedom. Well, I will return to foreign policy shortly, but before we we do, I we've been talking about the left and the failures of the left. But I did say at the beginning in the introduction that this time it seems like the Trump administration might actually have a plan. Do you think so? What do you see emerging now from, from Mar a Lago as the new administration, as cabinet picks are announced and, you know, and they're trying to set a new tone? Uh, does it seem like he has a plan? 
Well, I mean, I just say on this, the uh, I mean, we had Trump 1.0 and then there's now Trump 2.0. But if you think of Web 2.0, it's user generated content. You know, it's a platform you generate your own content. And I guess the big question around the Trump second administration, to what extent will it be Trump's um, policy or to what extent will it be people he brings in who are already perhaps in his orbit who then have their own agendas and do things within that? There was, I think, a great deal of that the first time around. I think he found that quite frustrating. Um, and I think the, there's still, I think, a risk of that. That said, having said that, it's quite interesting. I remember when Obama became president, everyone talked about he was reading a team of rivals about Lincoln. He brought in a team of rivals. He brought Hillary Clinton, um, I suppose, to keep your enemies close. Um, but with Trump, if you look at what he's brought in, J.D. Vance is his vice president. J.D. Vance is quite likely the next U.S. president after Trump. He was always a dark horse candidate to to grow into that to be that sort of character. He's a, he's almost the rights equivalent to Obama. A, you know, a very erudite guy wrote a book, highly educated, interesting background. And um, he and then also look at someone like Tulsi Gabbard, someone who has appeal actually to Democrats too. Uh, personally, I've had a lot of respect for Tulsi Gabbard for a Director lot of years. Director of National Intelligence, yeah, yeah, designate. precisely now, yeah. And so if um, so, between Gabbard and Vance, what he's bringing in are young, charismatic, self-possessed, intelligent people uh, who have a mind and know it. And uh, that's it's quite a team of rivals. If I look at it, there's a few other. There is Matt Gates, but anyway, <laughs> there's, there's a, yeah, there's David, a few you other want to say something, chaps, but. Uh, let's look at uh, Marco Rubio for a moment, Secretary of State. That was a surprise pick, uh, certainly a dark horse. Uh, Rubio uh, has a background as a China hawk. He blasts the Chinese over their treatment of the Uyghurs and democracy in Hong Kong and all these issues. However, in September, he wrote a 60-page report. Uh, I made a modest contribution to it, entitled The World China Made. Uh, which says China has done a very good job of seizing the commanding heights in key areas of technology and expanding its supply chains around the world, particularly to the global south. It's a very fair and objective assessment of China's accomplishments. And although he's very hostile to China, he is no less a hawk than he's ever been. He is a realist hawk. There's a big difference between Rubio's hawkish doesn't say Pompeo, who really believed and has said publicly that the Communist Party of China can be overthrown, or Matt Pottinger, who's been writing that. That's Mike the, Pompeo, the Trump's former Secretary of State. Former Secretary of State, who was publicly, by tweet, disinvited from the administration. So the fact that Rubio, as a hawk, can say, look, we have to acknowledge fairly that China's done some very impressive things and that if we want to keep up with them, we're going to need a total national effort, uh, I think is very encouraging because I think that China is a formidable rival. And if we delude ourselves about the degree of their accomplishments, we'll get ourselves in all kinds of horrible trouble. Now, it's been speculated by any number of commentators that, like Richard Nixon, the China hawk in 1972, who had the credibility to go to China and make a deal with Mao, having a China hawk like Rubio as Secretary of State sets the stage for a possible negotiation. I wouldn't take that too far because Trump likes to improvise. He doesn't know what the negotiation will be. But it does suggest that Trump is not looking for a dust-up with China, let alone a war, he's looking for a deal to the advantage of the United States. I very, uh, this is speculation, but it's an excellent report that he wrote. So it's encouraging. Of course, with Russia, China certainly, uh, Trump certainly wants to come to an agreement over the Ukraine war. That will be made more difficult by the Biden decision to let the uh, Ukrainians fire attackums and other Long Which they've done today. I don't know if you've seen yes, the news. Yes, they, they did indeed. Um, Donald Trump Jr. tweeted that this uh, uh, these guys are trying to start World War III. That's a, a bit hyperbolic, but not entirely misplaced. As I said, the liberals are so convinced their own uh, moral superiority, they're willing to risk the future of mankind in order to make a political point. Uh, but all these things suggest that Trump, as a realist who fundamentally cares about American w welfare more than he cares about what happens in other countries, is set at the stage for deals. 
So I'm hopeful about that. There's, of course, limited information. Uh, I can't read Trump's mind, but from the public record, this is the best I can get out of it. John, what do you think? Well, I want to add, begin by adding a small codicil to what you said about China and uh, Marco Rubio's report on China and what what it means, um, with with which I agree. Um, But there's also another element to this. Um, This was also a peace offer, not to Putin, but to the moderate wing of the Republican Party, to the non-Trumpian wing of the party. I mean, he was saying, I'm going to appoint people who share... Um, who don't completely share my views, but whom I recognize to be able, competent uh, people. Now, there was, there's no clash really between him and, um, uh, and Rubio on China, I think. And the reason for that is that the rest of America has been converted to the attitude that Trump took to China and to some partial extent to his view on protectionism and tariffs since then. I mean, I had the ex- odd experience uh, four years ago of writing and being asked to write articles saying, what will be the marvelous new changes that will occur now that we've got rid of Trump in foreign policy? And I had to say, well, there'll basically be, a lot of them will be the changes that have already been introduced by Trump, run by people who regard themselves as the adults in the room, but who have since shown themselves to be very far short of that. But I want to really, I, I don't want to keep throwing questions at you, David, but um, you, you made a very strong argument about um, the, uh, the, the failure of foreign policy, or what you believe will be the complete failure of Western policy towards Russia. But the question then would be, and it comes back to what you just asked, um, uh, Rod, namely, how do we get out of the pickle you think that we are in in relation to Russia? Because you are very dark predictions about that? Well, I'll tell you, John, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, It is a pickle because the last thing Trump wants to do is to look weak and be accused by his political enemies of being the man who lost Ukraine and and, uh, knelt before Russia. Uh, Putin certainly has the military advantage at this point. Uh, He's not going to give it up in return for uh, promises. He's had promises in the past. The Russian view, uh, for better or worse, true or false, is that assurances were given about the limits to the expansion of NATO, which were then ignored. So why should we believe Western promises this time? There's certainly a collapse of trust. Uh, the Russians are paranoid. Paranoid Russian is a pleonasm. Uh, then again, even paranoids have uh, real enemies. <coughs> so uh, that's going to be an extremely difficult problem to solve, and it's not at all clear to me uh, how Trump will go about it. It's a really difficult nut to crack, so I don't know at this point. I mean, more generally, I think one of the shifts we're probably seeing at the moment is that um, I think we need to make a distinction because I, I believe that keeping the peace does not mean the same thing as making the world perfect. And for a long time, America, I think the culture has become one where we all think that, again, we should come back to how the world ought to be. It ought to be perfect. There ought to be no conflict. There ought to be no no uh, no injustice around the world. Uh, there ought to be no poverty, all these types of uh, shibboleths of our culture. Uh, but actually, keeping the peace is, is not idealistic in this sense. It's more realistic. It's not about making us saved. It's recognizing we're fallen. To keep the peace means to understand that there's always going to be tensions between different communities, different nations, different cultures, and so on. The question is, how do you mitigate the worst outcomes of those most realistically? And I think one of the problems we've had in America's effort to become the world policeman in this culture that's become where we talk about it, there's this phrase, America is the world's policeman. It's, it's presuming that you can render the world peaceful uh, or, or perfectly uh, without conflict. But a world of peace is where you still have tensions, but they don't escalate to the point that it's a global conflagration. That's surely the point. And uh, my sense is that what Trump can offer is a stepping away from an ideological commitment to perfection and more of an embracing a realistic understanding of of what would be the terms of peace. I, I, I agree with you completely, Colin. It's simply that getting from point A to point B in Ukraine involves obstacles the overcoming of which are not clear to me at this point. And point B would be? Uh, a, a ceasefire, a, a cessation of hostilities. You can't have meaningful negotiations if you're shooting at each other. Yeah. 
Now, David, you shared with us your views on what you think is likely to happen in the new administration with China and with Russia and Ukraine. But tell us about Europe. I mean, we're sitting here above the Danube in, in the heart of Europe. And uh, a lot of European establishment politicians, leaders are frightened of Trump. They don't know what's coming next. Uh, in the UK, the, the Labour government, the Prime Minister, Starmer, Keir Starmer, sent over minions to help Kamala Harris win. That's probably not going to be regarded kindly by the incoming American president. How do you think Europe should, uh, should look over at what's happening in Washington and what can Europe expect? And the UK, I should add. Uh, as uh, a, a friend of mine who served in a high position in the first Trump administration says, Trump sincerely believes that the trade balance is America's economic scorecard. So there's a bit of zero-sum game in the way he looks at the world. Uh, we win, they lose. More exports for us, fewer exports for others. So given that Europe has a chronic trade surplus with the United States, uh, there is there is a risk that Trump will put tariffs on and try to reduce that, or will tell the Europeans, don't send cars to the United States, build more cars uh, in the build factories in the United States. Now, given that Germany's auto association is warning that of the 450,000 auto uh, workers in Germany, 200,000 could lose their jobs in the next two or three years. That's not going to go down very well. Uh, the Ukraine war, though, is really the biggest source of Europe's problems. So to the extent that Trump is able to solve that thing, that would have enormous economic benefits. Uh, uh, as I was saying today at the, at the uh, Danny Vincent's uh, conference, German industrial companies are now paying uh, 40 cents a kilowatt for electricity as opposed to 7 cents in the United States. And German energy-intensive industry has lost about 20% of its output in the last two or three years. It's a real catastrophe for Germany. So if you're able to normalize relations... Uh, with Russia over time, go back to a certain amount of natural gas deliveries, which Hungary, for example, is getting, uh, reduce the cost of energy, that would turn the tide of deindustrialization. So I think the single biggest benefit that Europe can hope for from Trump is to end the Ukraine war quickly and get back to normal. And that would have economic benefits that would vastly outweigh any annoyance from tariffs. So I think that's devoutly to be encouraged. Doesn't mean it will be, because many European politicians, as um, I think it was Balas Orban who was saying this today at the conference, the prime minister's political director. Yeah, many you're right. Many European politicians are so invested in the Ukraine war that they'll do whatever they can for their own careers to keep it going. If if it were just that, um, I think that would be the, extraordinarily important. But you've got to add to it the commitment in Europe, particularly in Germany, uh, but where in any European country where the Greens are a significant part of politics, you have a commitment to net zero, which, which does all of the things you've just described, uh, including raises the price of energy, of yes. course. Well, thank, thank you for emphasizing that. Uh, uh, there is excellent research demonstrating that Germany has enough natural gas reserves uh, available through fracking to replace all the Russian imports at a very low price at minimal environmental risk. And if the Germans did not have this green dementia uh, ruining their economic policy and they attended to their own affairs properly, they could solve these problems. So a lot of, you know, it's, I think it's perfectly fair at the United States to tell the Europeans, physician, heal thyself. Fix your own house. Don't expect us to do it for you. David, how do you think that the re-election of Donald Trump will affect the rise of populist parties of the right in Europe? I mean, clearly here in, in Hungary, we're thrilled. We who are conservatives are thrilled by Trump's election because he and Prime Minister Viktor Orban have a close relationship. And Hungary has been kicked around a great deal by the Biden administration and the current American ambassador. So we're happy about that. Is this something that, that other populist right parties in Europe should uh, cheer for, or is that a false hope? 
Well, the populist wave actually began in Europe with Herrt Wilders in Holland, then with the uh, September uh, elections uh, in uh, the three East German states where the AFD did extremely well, the French elections. So the populist wave preceded Trump. The difficult, the, the, what Trump brought to this was an incredible sensitivity to the way the electorate thinks and an unusual but very effective way of formulating problems in the way that ordinary people formulate them in their own minds, giving people the confidence that he was concerned about their problems and thought about things the way they did. The difficulty with European populists, yes, it does give them an impetus, but uh, for example, in Germany, which is you know, the most important European economy, uh, I have a lot of sympathy for some things the AFD is doing, and many friends in the AFD, but they have yet to advance an economic program. They simply have not put themselves forward as a governing party. Uh, in England, uh, we were just talking about that over lunch, you've got Nigel Far uh, Farage's Reform Party, which is part of the populist wave, but it's stalled because it doesn't have the leadership, doesn't have the program to challenge the establishment. Uh, <coughs> France, but you've got lawfare directed against Marine Le Pen. Uh, uh, it's, uh, that's a murky situation. So, although, yes, there is the impetus, I don't see the leadership among European populists of the quality of a Donald Trump to be able to capture that. And I don't see the populist parties outside of Fidesz in Hungary and you know, Slovakia, a couple of other places, perhaps Czech Republic, being in position to govern yet. Still a very immature movement. I would say Fidesz is, is actually sui generis for this reason, that it was in fact a conservative party rather than a populist one, but a conservative party which saw the populists emerging as a result of the decline of the communists, among other things, and reached out and put its arm around them and brought it into the coalition. Now, that's, there's a parallel there in England. Britain, the Tory party, had traditionally been a conservative party, very traditional, sober, establishment-minded, but it had always been a patriotic national party standing up for the country against various enemies. And, and, um, and what happened in the, seven, in the 60s and 70s, it lost that to some degree. And it became, um, a lot, I mean, particularly after Thatcher, who was, a na who was also a patriotic nationalist figure, of course. After her, the party seemed to become another European mainstream centre-right party that didn't really want to be associated with these unrespectable people to the right. And as a result, and because of its own dramatic failures in the last 14 years, uh, it's all of a sudden, it lost a great number of its members to Farage. Now, I would disagree with you about the talents of Farage and think he is a genuinely a brilliantly talented um, politician. He's one of the people of whom we say, you know, uh, he's the man who makes the weather. He's made the weather to a great extent in the last few years. Uh, whether he can actually grow a party downwards from him, that I think is open to question. But he certainly, I think, can keep enough support in the electorate to deny the Conservatives a return to power in four years or so unless they come to some kind of terms. I, I, I won't challenge your knowledge of British politics, John. You know, David, I, I have been uh, over in this country for three years. And one of the things that struck me immediately about being here as an American conservative is what Viktor Orban and Fidesz could teach our own Republican Party. And it's precisely this. I think Viktor Orban was the first of his kind to realize that we are in a post-liberal moment. And he he saw that the left, the establishment left, was were actually operating as post-liberals. This is far back as 2010 when Viktor Orban first took office. And that if we on the right continue to play by the old liberal norms, we're going to get our clocks cleaned by these people. So he knew that just to hold our ground, we had to be post-liberal as well. Uh, not because we're bad guys who want to get one over on them, but because They've been playing by these norms for quite some time now. And I'm hoping that the, the Trump administration, the Republican Party, can study what has been done here in Hungary 
and learn from it. Well, let me ask you a question, Rod. One of the most important, probably the single most important economic measure that Orban introduced is an unprecedented level of support for families. Something like a tenth of the whole federal budget in Hungary goes to family support. And they've done a great deal to reverse the demographic decline of Hungary. They haven't finished the job, but they've made real progress without any question. Uh, and that as a patriotic objective that the Hungarian nation should survive by having children, I think is probably quite popular in Hungary and has contributed to a success. Mm -hmm. I wonder what would happen in the United States if we went told the Americans uh, we can't survive with a fertility rate of 1.6 or 1.7, which is what we've got now. Uh, we want you to have more children. We want to help you do that and give these kinds of incentives. Would it have the same impact in the United States? I don't think it would now. I think J.D. Vance, if should he become president, uh, the realities of the demographic, uh, the birth dearth, the demographic winter will have become, they will, will have edged more into mainstream conversation by then. But if they tried it now, the media would flip out. And I think the American people are not far enough along in the conversation to be receptive to that. The thing that I find so impressive about the way Orban reads the political situation is he understood early on that the civil society has become part of the state apparatus. It, not necessarily in, intentionally, but it just has. The boundaries have gone down. And so you have someone like George Soros coming to Hungary to found a university. Normally that would be a wonderful thing. But Orban understood that this would be a beachhead for globalist liberalism here in Hungary, and he fought it. Now this is the kind of thing that someone who is a classical liberal, many of my sympathies are still a classical liberalism, I would have been appalled by that. But once you actually get here and understand the lay of the land, and once you see, as J.D. Vance did, how much the universities in our own country are enemies of the common good, you begin to understand more where Orban is coming from. And that's the kind of thing that I hope the Trump administration can learn from him, to the very great horror of conventional liberals and those on the left. But I think that's just the world we're in. We, we're not, not living in the world as it was right after the end of the Cold War. The thing that uh, I worry about in the United States is the condition of our young people. Uh, the educational system has completely betrayed working class kids. Uh, we have uh, a competence level in basic high school mathematics of 23%. 23% of high school kids know basic math which you need to be an industrial worker. You have to be able to read instructions on machine and do minimal programming and so forth. Uh, I think we need emergency measures to give people a leg up economically. For example, uh, uh, the uh, Florida's already begun to do this under DeSantis. They have a very extensive community college program and they're working with manufacturers to produce a curriculum for community colleges with work study, it's like an apprenticeship program in Europe. Uh, we need to give American kids a sense that there's a future for them, there's a path to improvement, uh, and get them out of this ideological woke miasma, which masquerades as an educational system, throw open the windows, bring in some fresh air, give people opportunity. If we don't do that, uh, one of the greatest dangers is that Trump's attempt to revive manufacturing will run into uh, uh, an absolute shortage of labor. Does this not get to a deeper question, though, about uh, you know, what is the thing that we now argue about in politics? Because it seems to me that you know, if you go back to the 20th century, you had the communists, the capitalists, they all uh, had different... Uh, we think of it as very divided, but if you think about it, they shared something. They shared what the question was. They both agreed that the problem was political economic. Should, it be, uh, should the political economy be best run by the state or by the market, right? What should be the main driver? That was the 20th century. The thing is today, I don't see what the shared question is because we have the two sides and we're not, we, we don't agree on the problem because we think that the problem is each other. So one side looks at the other and say, you're the disease and I'm the cure and vice versa. And, uh, and I do wonder with this if, um, if we have yet to determine what, are, what is the fundamental problem we have in our society today in 2024 and going forward. What really is the problem? We know we have problems, but what is the, pro what is the problem? What is the nature of that problem? 
And um, I don't think we've really settled on the problem on which both sides can agree on and then develop different responses to. Uh, I, but but I, I, have, I have a theory, which is yes, simply that sorry. I think it's coming on this, is that I think going forward, and it will definitely be the case if there is a single cyber war incident, if a war breaks out and there is an at- attempt to shut down the National Health Service somewhere, I mean, the UK has already shut it down, basically. But, the, but if, if there was some sort of a cyber attack on fundamental infrastructure that really affected ordinary people and people who vote, then I think that uh, the likely emergent distinction we'll have is not state versus market, the political economy, but it'll be digital versus analog. To what extent do we want digital technology in our lives? There'll be political parties that say we should have it in all areas. There'll be other ones that say we should only have it for work. Some will say just for defense, some none at all. That's my sense of where we're going. But I'm wondering, in, this, in the context of this sense of a vibe shift from, you know, the, uh, the, uh, from this, something about... Trump's elections led to the end of the, the, the liberal order, this post-liberal order. Okay, post-liberal order is quite, it's quite a negation. It's not liberal. But what is it? What, what is the fundamental well, it, difference? It remains to be seen. I mean, uh, Ross Douthat, uh, the conservative columnist at the New York Times, had a really interesting piece over the weekend to say that whatever else one might say of this time, we can say for sure the 20th century is over. The re-election of Trump means that. Uh, and it also means, by implication, that anything goes because the, the, the fragmentation that has come with digital life, with the internet, and so many of the other knock-on social effects of that has opened the Overton window. We just can't say what's coming next, but what we can say is all the old boundaries, all the old means of controlling the discourse, controlling the, the direction of history, to speak in a Fukuyama sense, they're gone, they're over. Is that part of the vibe shift? Is that the most fundamental part of the vibe shift? Or is doubt it wrong? Well, um, first of all, of course, the fact that the old boundaries have been eroded um, and the old guardians and the gatekeepers of discourse no longer have the power they had because the newspapers have discredited them. The media in America and Britain and Europe have discredited themselves by their... An incredible degree of bias, actually. Uh, and there are other uh, people coming up to replace them. One of them being, of course, X under Elon Musk, which is now one of the most productive, uh, sorry, one of the most uh, uh, read sources of news. Just as, for example, in England, GB News, a kind of um, um, scrappy young news upstart, uh, uh, which is avowedly a kind of a conservative outlet uh, of news, uh, that, that now the other night, and Farage's TV program had more viewers than BBC and ITV combined. That's remarkable. So, that so it's remarkable, isn't it? And um, now, I, but it doesn't mean to say this, all of this uh, liberalism or liberta- li- uh, liber- liberation breaking out does not mean to say there aren't going to be new barriers. In fact, there's a lot of people trying to impose barriers, um, and that includes Western governments. They, it no longer includes the U.S. government because Trump is an avowed enemy of using, um, containing disinformation or combating disinformation as a new, as a form of disinformation. He's against that. But all the Western governments have been cooperating to try to control and and starve the the the, the starve the public of news uh, generated about and from their rivals in politics, and that is still a really major threat. And there will have to be, there will be battles between America under Trump and the EU under, un, under Ursula von der Leyen on exactly this issue. Who said, Ursula von der Leyen said at Davos back in January that that's the number one issue, number one challenge facing Europe. Not the war, not the economy, not migration, managing disinformation. And I mean, that tells you where they stand. Colin? I mean, one thing I kind of disagree on, actually, is the idea that uh, the, the 20th century is now over. I think that, we, in a sense, we've returned to it, in a sense, because remember in the early 90s, there was this Fukuyama phrase, the end of history. And that's kind of the ethic that's dominated the last 30 years, that we've transcended the human condition and we can live in a, in a fantastical world of how it ought to be instead of the reality of what it actually is. And it seems to me that after 30 years of this, what we're seeing now is the end of the end of history. We're not, it's the, the end of that era. And in a sense, 
the, 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 diff, the issues over which we divide may now be different. Perhaps it's digital versus analog, perhaps, going forward. But um, the fact that there is something shared to divide over, the fact that history continues, history is a reality, that this period of the end of history was itself just a historical artifact, quite a curious one, an exception that proves the rule before and after of history, uh, I think is, is probably more true. So uh, I kind of disagree with the idea that it's the, it's the end of the 21st century. I think it's, in a sense, a return to the continuity with something which actually makes sense, and I think at a deep sort of intuitive level we understand. Callum, in a, a way I agree with you, uh, Ronald Reagan was not a traditional liberal by any means, nor was he a traditional conservative. The United States invented the whole of the digital age, every invention from flat screens to optical networks to the mouse and so forth, as a byproduct of winning the Cold War against Russia through massive government support for high-tech research, not subsidies to existing industries, but a defense driver for technology. This was the great experience of my youth. I saw the United States transformed in a short period of time, and it was a byproduct of our winning the Cold War against Russia. Why can't we do that now with respect to China? And it was Ronald Reagan who was, he didn't impose tariffs on Japanese automakers, he imposed absolute quotas. You want to sell more than X amount of cars, you build plants in the United States. Otherwise, take a hike, guys. Much tougher than anything Trump has proposed. That was free market Reagan, who talked Milton Friedman, but uh, was, you know, industrial policy when it came down to it. So there's a lot in the 20th century, per Callum's point, which we could revive and learn from. Uh, my biggest worry is that the damage done to the psychic and educational and indeed physical health of the population, per RFK Jr.'s comments, has left us worse equipped for these challenges than we were a generation ago. We have to attend to those things, particularly the educational system. Well, let's uh, land this plane, fellas, by uh, asking you one more thing. Let's ponder one more thing. I don't know if you saw it, but the actress Eva Longoria, I think her name is, has announced that she's leaving America to go spend half her time in Spain and half her time in Mexico because America has become a dystopia now. Now, Mexico has something like five to seven times the murder rate than the United States, but leave that aside. She wants to get away from Trump and Trumpism. How do you think the arts and popular culture industry will respond to the new regime? Uh, do you think they will adjust themselves mm -hmm. to a new reality and ask themselves, what did we do wrong? How, how did we lose so much touch with the country? Or do you think they will double, triple down on wokeness? Well, I think the you know, UFC champions are going to have a much bigger effect on the popular culture. I think, yeah, I think it's a very hard question to answer because normally you might say, that um, they would uh, rebel. The arts kind of, they're fractious, typical people. And they would rebel against the arrival of someone like Trump and, and urge completely out country policies, in effect, imply. The problem is that that's already their position. I mean, they, they, it's hard to see how they can go further into wokeness. And in fact, there's a gr in, what you have now in Hollywood is an enormous number of films made uh, on the on the basis of kind of woke um, uh, sensibilities, uh, which don't do very well, and then occasional wonderfully successful movies made by rebels within the system, uh, the, uh, which which is um, uh, which, which is not, I think, something that's going to be happening for the long term. I do think that um, after Trump has left, there will be favorable movies about him. Uh, that, that, that is what's likely to happen. He'll be, just as just been a favorable movie about Reagan. Now, it had to, that movie had to fight its way against the uh, popular opinion within Hollywood. But it's, and then it got hostile reviews. But the actor, uh, D Dennis Quaid, who played Reagan, is a marvelous choice for the part. He looks like him. And it's had a, it's had a quite a, without great reviews, it's had a very successful run at the box office. So I think you'll get that kind of response. He devances his president and, and people are suddenly saying, you know, Trump really was quite a good guy. 
Uh, one thing, I, I mean, you and I have had this conversation for several years, but uh, we've had a slight disagreement where I, I've never thought the woke stuff is the end of the world because I always felt it was a fashion and it would pass. And if, if you go back to the 1950s and 60s, the establishment was quite conservative. And then you had the sort of liberal movement in the 60s and these hippie movement emerge and so on. And my thought for a few years is that uh, people who are maybe uh, 15 now or 14 now are probably going to be kind of conservative hippies. They're going to be un-PC radical cultural revolutionaries if revolution means uh, rebelling against the sort of uh, stiff orthodoxies of the, of the prevailing establishment culture. And uh, so I think we're, we're going to see some of that emerge. And I also think it's worth noting that if you look at the popular culture, the big popular culture, the big movies, the, the Star Wars and the, the Harry Potter stuff, Lord of the Rings, all this, all this stuff, it's all really telling the same story, which is, uh, which is um, it's 1945. It's uh, the, the plucky guy with morality on his side defeating the big evil bad, bad guy. And I, and I do think, if you, but my point is that there's almost nothing in our popular culture today which pre predates 1945. Any book from before that is in the classic section. And, and my sense is what's going to happen now. The culture is about to change. Something's happening at the moment. And I think in 10 years, the art being produced will have almost no relationship to the stuff we're seeing right now. All this stuff we're going through now is going to look incredibly dated in three or four years. Uh, I, if I could offer another way of looking at this, I think that every one of the antinomian loners with a problem with authority who are our hero. They are obsessive theme in American popular culture. Every character played by Clint Eastwood or John Wayne or Sylvester Stallone or whoever, the previous generation, uh, they're all, in a sense, versions of the Christian and Pilgrim's progress, the sinner on a lone journey to salvation. It's the cowboy who cleans up the town but has to ride off into the sunset, the private eye who solves the case but goes off by himself. And if there was any American politician ever in our history who encapsulated that lone antinomian pilgrim, it's Donald Trump. He is a hero of our popular culture. And whether or not they make movies about him, I think this will be an inspiration for a revival of the kind of character who begins in American fiction with Huckleberry Finn and goes all the way through Clint Eastwood. Can, can I just say, as a non-American, I completely agree with this, that Trump, there's something about Trump. I'm not, I've never been a big fan of Trump, personally. But I tell you what, I respect that guy after the last couple of years. There is nothing more American than this idea of you just keep, you never quit, and you keep trying until you find some sort, sort of success. It's Mr. an extraordinary yeah. story. The last Mr. Smith years. goes to Washington. He's a Frank Capra movie. Oh, dear. Frank Capra movie produced by who? Jerry Bruckheimer or something? <laughs> okay, well, let, me, let, me close on a, let me close on a characteristically pessimistic note. I used to be a film critic. I, I left that world as a film critic at the New York Post. And I would always hear when I would, we would talk about getting conversations with people about whether or not Hollywood is liberal. Well, of course it is. But uh, people would say to me, people who didn't know what they were talking about would say, yes, but of course... Money drives everything, and if they weren't making money on liberal films, they wouldn't be making so many of them. And I would have to tell them, no, they're willing to lose lots of money on liberal films because what really matters in the film industry is the respect of your peers. You know, it's, you're fine to lose the money as long as you can be patted on the back and been given a Humanitas Award by advancing some left-wing agenda. This is also true, by the way, for newspapers, for major media. They don't care that they're losing ratings and advertising dollars as long as they are respected among themselves. That can't go on forever, mind you. I mean, eventually the, the, the piper must be paid. But I think we have a long way to go with our pop culture because I was talking with some Hollywood people recently and they were liberals but were griping and just wailing and gnashing their teeth over the wokeness and how it's stifling creativity. One of them said to me, do you remember that the Academy, the Motion Picture Academy, put in all these rules saying that if anyone wants to be considered for Oscar, uh, for Oscars, uh, Academy Awards, they have to full tick off the boxes, the wokeness boxes, the diversity boxes. That is a straitjacket on creativity. But here's the thing. 
it strikes directly at what drives so many movie makers. They want the recognition of their peers. They don't want money. Of course, everyone wants to make money, but more than anything, they want recognition. And I think until and unless the Academy revokes these ridiculous rules, we're still going to have a problem. And there's going to be a lot more money to be lost in Hollywood before they wake up. Well, gentlemen, it was a fantastic time. Thank you all for, for being here. David, you're going to be here in Budapest for um, much of the next year, so I'm sure we'll have you back. Privilege and honor. Thank and you, Rod. Thanks to you all for joining us today. I'm Rod Dreer from The View from the Danube. Thank you, Shekhar. Thank you, Shekhar. Thank you, Shekhar.